of you weren't flapping your wings, but I, I'm sure inside your hearts you were. Um, so exciting. So anyhow, Taylor is at the podium here delivering the opening statement. Um, the next picture is a picture of the defendant uh, physicians in the dock. Next picture is a photograph of the named defendant, Carl Brandt. He's age 43 here and was the personal physician to Hitler and the Reich Commissioner for Health and Sanitation. The next photograph is Dr. Leo Alexander, who's very important. Uh, he was a Boston neurologist and psychiatrist, a consultant to the trial on medical ethics, and along with uh, a man named Dr. Andrew Ivey, drafted the Nuremberg Code. Uh, here, Dr. Alexander is examining a Polish girl who was permanently crippled from being a subject in an experiment. The next one, um, this is a freezing experiment at Dachau. The human subject is a political prisoner. He's being immersed in ice water. The freezing experiments were instigated by the German Air Force. Uh, they wanted to know how to warm up aviators who were forced to parachute into the cold waters of the North Sea. In these experiments, human subjects were put in tanks of ice water for up to three hours, and then they'd be rewarmed by a variety of methods, including surrounding them by naked women. In other experiments, subjects were kept naked outdoors in freezing weather, and many died. The rest of these pictures all come from um, the evidence that was uh, given at the trial. These, uh, the next photograph, um, I find this one very painful. These are photographs of an inmate from Dachau who's undergoing the, the terrific pain of low pressure from high altitude experiments also instigated by the German Air Force. They would lock the research subject in a low pressure chamber and simulate uh, pressures at high altitude up to 68,000 feet. Then they would plunge the research subject into a rapid descent without oxygen and witness and record his uh, inevitable painful death. This next one is uh, a photograph of a young woman who underwent bone experiments. In these experiments, human subjects would have their legs broken, and then bone transplants would be performed. Transplantations of entire limbs from one person to another were performed, and then usually the amputee would be killed. Next one. These are uh, sulfur burns that would be uh, inflicted on inmates at Buchenwald, and then they'd burn the human subjects and then rub the burns with various kinds of preparations to see which ones would heal, which ones would cause infection, necrosis, and finally death. Next one. These are what the tanks look like that preserve the corpses. The next one. Here's an assemblage of corpses that were part of the transplantation experiments. They would put them into tanks containing formaldehyde for their preservation. To me, this has an absolutely otherworldly look to it, um, particularly the one there with just the legs. It's, dehumanization is the only word I can think of. It's, um, the last one here is a, is a corpse that was carved up in preparation for dissection. And that's the end of the pictures. Now, I asked myself many times in preparation, with what degree of detail should I describe these horrific Nazi experiments at the conference? And it's true, I did just show you some very disturbing pictures. But I assure you, if you read the transcript of the doctor's trial, you'd appreciate that there are many worse tortures that I've left out that could not be captured in photographic evidence. And I discovered something. I simply could not bring myself to say some of the things that happened to those people out loud. That was one of the surprises that I didn't anticipate in singing this song, that I would be unable to be a reporter of the truth. I'm reluctant to admit this, but there's something compelling about reading what happened in the research base of the camps. The victims of the human experimentation were able to tell the truth. Many times I found I couldn't put the transcript of those victim stories down. I couldn't breathe as I read those transcripts, spoken now over 60 years ago by people who are long dead. But you can feel their suffering coming from the printed page. I don't think I'll ever read those transcripts again, but I do remember being there inside that horrible little box of Nazi experimentation 
in the pursuit of damnable knowledge about what might happen if you force the human body to exceed its limitations. Perhaps, too, this explains why the prosecution chose the medical experiments as a basis of their charge. They knew those survivors' stories were compelling and so imaginable. Many of the deaths in the concentration camps took place, at least to me, in unimaginable circumstances, like lining up to take a shower that turns out to be a poisonous gas. Who's ever been in such a situation? But it's not so hard to imagine how it might feel to be a human research subject. The setting would be familiar to all of us in this room, a medical facility of some kind, perhaps a laboratory in the doctor's office. I don't know about the rest of you, but I always feel so vulnerable when I go to the doctor. You sit there, you wait all alone in the examining room, half naked, dressed only in a little white paper gown. Not only do I feel stripped of my clothes, I feel stripped of my identity and my dignity. And if there's something wrong with me physically, I feel anxious and mortal. I feel trapped inside this imperfect, confining, aging, physical entity that weighs too much and hurts so much in the morning. All things considered, I'd rather be somewhere else. The truth is, the human body is a prison, and living inside of one is hard. That's the most basic fact of our universal human condition and the basis of much of our suffering. So the stories described in the doctor's trial are ones that we can imagine. We can feel how trapped those human research subjects must have felt in their multiple prisons. The prison of the concentration camp and then that other prison we all know too well, the prison of the human body. Except in the concentration camps, the doctor wasn't there to make you feel better to transform your prison into a room with a door or a place you could live in or with. He was there to use you, to cause you suffering, and to do your harm. And so I have to confess to finding the stories of the Nazi experimentation compelling, and I own up to some morbid fascination about them. Perhaps some of you know what I'm talking about. I wonder fear, really, whether some emotions in the same genre, compulsion and morbid fascination, may have motivated the Nazi doctors themselves to perform those experiments. I shudder at the thought that I might understand them. I suspect that Telford Taylor had the same conversation with himself about how much detail to go into about the experiments. He took the high road. His description of the experiments in the opening statement was purely factual and devoid of any details of suffering. His list included, besides the experiments I just described, infecting prisoners with malaria and typhus, inflicting wounds that were then infected with mustard gas or pus to induce blood poisoning, forcing inmates to drink salt water, sterilization experiments, castrations, experiments on effective methods of poisoning and practice for the final solution burning inmates with incendiary bombs, and killing Jewish inmates in order to help build a skeleton collection. How could we be talking about doctors? Doctors are healers. Doctors help people prevent and cure disease, alleviate human suffering. We know that the Nazi doctors swore to the Hippocratic Oath how could they have sworn to do no harm to their patients and then engage in gruesome scientific experiments that did not benefit them, but harmed them and caused them to suffer and often to die? I suppose the cheap answer might be the Hippocratic Oath only applies in the therapeutic concept, context. This is scientific research. In a therapeutic doctor-patient relationship, the doctor's duty is clear. But these human subjects, they weren't our patients, they're our prisoners. And even if they were research subjects, who knew what the ethics were of using them in scientific experiments? That was how the defense argument went. But they did know. There were German codes predating the Second World War that set out the ethically permissible boundaries of research on human beings. A 1900 document called the Prussian Directive required the fully informed consent of the human subject in research. 
he had to be told of all the adverse consequences that may result from the intervention. Then again in 1931, the Reich Minister of the Interior promulgated a set of guidelines for medical experimentation. The Reich Circular demanded that the researcher obtain the informed consent of the human subject, that he document any deviations from protocol, and they justify the study of especially vulnerable populations. Some have argued that the principles in the 1931 Reich Circular were even more inclusive and formalistic than the Nuremberg Code, and that they demand complete responsibility of the medical profession for carrying out human experimentation. So it's just historically inaccurate to say that there were no norms of proper research conduct before the Second World War. When Dr. Ivey cited the 1931 Reich Circular in his testimony to show that the Nazi doctors were surely familiar with the ethics of human experimentation, defense counsel responded that it was only a guideline and did not have the force of law. Frankly, I don't care if the 1931 Reich Circular had the force of law. As far as I'm concerned, ethics need not have the force of law to be binding. But then again, I'm not much of a legal positivist. The Nazis were. I don't care what you call them, law, directives, guidelines, ethical principles. Those documents described in detail how a doctor was supposed to treat a human research subject. I suspect that each of those Nazi doctors knew about those moral principles, and if they didn't, they should have as members of the medical profession. But even if they'd known about the ethics of human experimentation, it wouldn't have mattered. The racist theories about Aryan supremacy, theories embraced by most doctors in Germany in the 1930s, managed to move the subjects of those experiments out of the category of humanity. Hence, there was little ethical angst about how to treat them. The packages of the Holocaust and the little box within the box that we're looking out now, at now, both of these packages were wrapped in a set of prevailing ideas known as social Darwinism. Fearing degeneration of the human race and of the Nordic German race in particular, the social Darwinist established a kind of Rassen hygiene or racial hygiene. By the mid-1920s, Russian hygiene merged with the ideologies of National Socialism, and the creation and maintenance of racial purity became a vital component of uh, Nazi ideology. Given the importance of biology in Nazi ideology, many doctors were attracted to the Nazi movement. By 1942, more than half the doctors in the country were members of the Nazi party, and the doctors were represented in the SS seven times more than the average for the employed male population. Most of the 20 or more institutes for racial hygiene were established at German universities before Hitler rose to power. And by 1932, Rassen hygiene was a fixture in the German medical community. The practical results of the Nazi ideology of Rassen hygiene were three state programs, the Nuremberg Laws, which we just heard about, the Sterilization Law, and the Euthanasia Program. German doctors were intimately involved in all three of them. Somewhere between 350 to 400,000 people were sterilized by German doctors. Between 1939 and 1941, German doctors killed 70,000 patients from mental institutions in what turned out to be a rehearsal for the subsequent destruction of Jews, homosexuals, communists, gypsies, Slavs, and prisoners of war. It was a logical extension of their medical power to use concentration camp prisoners as human subjects in experiments. It should come as no surprise. Rawson hygiene made all of these medical practices morally defensible to the doctors who engaged in them. That was what made the idea so potent. It urged the doctors to relieve the groaning lifeboat of useless eaters and the racially impure in order to save the human race. Rawson hygiene looked like a superseding moral principle to trump the Kantian notion of respect for persons. L.A. Wiesel wrote about a dissertation he once read in which a psychiatrist argued that the sense of morality of the Nazi killers was not impaired. They knew how to differentiate good and evil. Their sense of reality was impaired. Human beings were not human beings in their eyes. They were abstractions. 
I quarrel with that psychiatrist's characterization. The impairment was one of morality, not of reality. To move another human being out of the moral community, to treat him as an abstraction, as non-human, as a means to another's end, that maneuver is a violation of morality. But Ross and Hygiene created the illusion that the so-called science the doctors were engaged in promoted the public good. It was a moral sleight of hand and enabled them to sleep at night, at least some of them, probably most of them. But it's important to have clarity about this. Believing in that illusion was a wrong thing to do. It may have skewered what the Nazi doctors believed to be reality, but at its heart, the impairment was moral, not ontological. The transcripts of the doctor's trial reveal that some doctors in the concentration camps could not sleep at night. For example, one defendant, Dr. Romberg, testified about his efforts to protest what was going on. Dr. Romberg was an assistant to Dr. Rascher, who was a minor satellite of Himmler's. Himmler had given his consent to the high altitude experiments using concentration